Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a little out of my comfort zone. Normally when I'm asked to speak about something, it's a, a pretty uh, current topic that we're working on with you know, very specific policy issues. And I always fight to say, well, could I have 12 minutes instead of 11 minutes? Or you know, can I have you know, nine minutes instead of eight minutes? So um, both the opportunity and the challenge to talk a little bit longer. We'll see how I do. So, but I am gonna just set the timer on my phone so that I can kind of keep track of of how I, of, to make sure that I get through the end. Um, and I'm over 50, so this doesn't always go as quickly. Okay. So um, it, it is a pleasure um, to be here, and I wanted to just first um, start by introducing you to Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that works at the state, local, and national levels to promote healthy schools and healthy students. We believe in the very simple and common sense notion that healthy students are better learners and that health and wellness should be incorporated into every aspect of the school experience. We have a long history of engagement with the Chicago Public Schools at the district level and at the community level on a range of policies around uh, food, nutrition, and environment. For a number of reasons, um, our work at the community level has really focused on grammar schools with the exception of um, working with the high school culinary programs here in Chicago. So I'm especially pleased to be here and have the opportunity um, to talk with all of you, and particularly those of you that are in the high school uh, level at, at the Chicago Public Schools, but obviously my, my comments are appropriate for everyone. So I wanted to kind of start by showing you this headline from the Chicago Tribune that appeared um, that said, front fold, top of the paper, kids do not eat broccoli. So it really struck me the day that this was on the top fold of the paper that, wow, has this debate about school food <laughs> come a long way. Um, it used to be really hard for me to get anyone to pay attention to it or to really uh, consider, take it as a serious issue. And I think what's really interesting is what was on the bottom fold, um, the toppling of the Egyptian government. Um, and so I, I think as I, I thought about this, this talk today, you know, I think in part this is going to be a, a talk about why and how did school food become such a big part of the public debate? And what are all of the issues around food, around school food, that has made this such an important issue? So I, I think like many things, there are some very basic political issues that underlie the discussion that we're having in this country about school food. You know, it's about, to some extent, a fundamental political divide in terms of whether something is about individual, is this problem of childhood obesity about individual behavior, poor eating, laziness, bad parenting, or is this about the lack of the conditions in our communities, in our health system, um, in our economy, that allow families to thrive and that allow people to have access to healthy food. And I think as I will go through six or seven decades of history about the school meal program, you'll see that that is an underlying issue. The other underlying issue is the question of who benefits from these programs. At this point, this is a big federal program with lots of money. And so I think, again, as the debate today and the debate over the past number of decades have taken place, you'll see that this is really, this is also a discussion about whether these programs are designed to benefit children and their families or whether they're designed to benefit farmers. And if farmers, which farmers? And, and so again, I think a lot of the debate is about those things. 
there are a lot of people that are engaged in this discussion about school food. And I think for some people, this is a discussion about a core American value of equal opportunity for everyone about, and it's part of the fabric of making sure that all kids have access to a good education, and clearly, if they're going to learn effectively, they, need, they can't be hungry. They need to be well-nourished. And how do we make sure, what is our commitment as a country to make sure that that takes place? It's also obviously a big discussion about our food system. And, you know, my kids thought the food system started and began with the refrigerator. And I think a lot of people's understanding of food systems, you know, is pretty limited because we're exposed to such a limited part of that food system. But I, so it really ends up being a discussion about agriculture interests over health interests, global food systems versus local food systems. And I think finally this discussion about school food is also a discussion about education policy. It is a discussion about um, whether or not we, um, and again, the big we, our country, our education sector, is committed to educating the whole child and understanding all of the needs of the child, or whether or not we should be more focused on very specific education outcomes. So hopefully, as I go through the uh, presentation this morning, um, you know, you'll see how all of those themes fall through. So first, I'm going to start with just talking about the changing nutritional needs of students um, from various points in time in this program to today, and then a history of the school meal program, and I know that that was touched on a little bit this morning, and give you an overview of what the school meal program is like today, talk about the, both the national and local debates on school food policy, and then talk about how that debate is happening here in Chicago. And then, of course, I would be remiss if I did not take a few moments to talk with you about the role that you as teachers can play um, in this whole debate about school food. So um, meeting student nutritional needs. So the National School Lunch Program began in 1946. And I think, again, this might have been alluded to. This is a poster from the War Food Administration, which was set up to help schools create lunch programs. Because they realized that their they, as the military, had a vested interest in making sure that our children were, and it really, our young men, our boys, were properly nourished. Because during World War II, at least 40% of the rejected recruits were turned away on the basis of poor nutrition. So the big concern in the 40s was about the lack of access to any food, the lack of access to calories, to nutrition, and the need to make sure that children, um, in this case the military was particularly concerned about boys, um, were uh, getting adequate calories as they were growing up. Fast forward to 2010 and the most recent debate on the child nutrition program, and a number of former generals got together and created an organization called Operation Readiness and had a pretty strong voice in this debate about school meal program. And they concluded that, um, again, this issue about how we were feeding our children, this time both boys and girls, was again a matter of national interest, but for the opposite problem. 75% of all young Americans, 17 to 24, are unable to join the military because they failed to graduate high school, they have criminal records, or are physically unfit. And being overweight or obese turned out to be the leading medical reason why applicants failed to join the military. So we obviously saw from the 40s to now, a dramatic change in the status and the health status of our young people. And obviously, why all that happened and all the changes in lifestyles, opportunity to healthy food, our food system, physical activity, um, you know, is a whole nother uh, discussion. Um, 
so, but I'm going to kind of jump into the history of the school meal program and try to hit on some of the major trends in the various decades that kind of created the um, situation we are at today. So to start with in the 1930s, where you really saw the beginnings of an organized school meal program. At this time, this program was about the stabilization of food prices. And at that time, the government actually destroyed surplus crops in order to keep food up. And there had been a public outcry that while so many Americans were hungry, how could we be destroying food? And so the USDA, the government, joined up with WPA workers and, and started directing surplus food to community centers and schools. And therein you saw a, your kind of first, the beginnings of you know, what has become the National School Lunch Program. There were two other trends during this time that I think were important and worth, worth mentioning. This was really an age of new, the new nutrition, the new science of nutrition, and the emerging field of home economics, and one of the few roles at the time for professional women. And so as we were starting to think about bringing food to schools, there was a new science emerging about what was healthy for us to eat. And no one really thought or talked about that from a science point of view. And so there was a group of women, professional women, armed with this information that went back out to the communities to try to share this knowledge. And, and, and schools became an important place for it. The other big trend that was happening during this time, and, and to some ways continues, is bringing immigrants into the mainstream. There were lots of you know, hull houses, lots of settlement homes that were designed to help, Amer to help immigrants um, become Americans. And clearly, you know, food is such, uh, is such a way that either you hang on to your culture or you assimilate in another culture. And so the whole issue of school food ended up being tied up in this discussion about how do we Americanize um, the immigrants that were coming. So, in the next decade, uh, kind of school food got serious, and we actually saw three national interests coalesce to really create the political will for the first really official structured school meal program. As I mentioned earlier, military readiness was clearly a factor and part of this debate. And as we talked about in the 30s where food support prices were important. The interests of farmers were very, very much a part of the motivation for creating this. And third, the social welfare movement, those, the social reformers became concerned also about malnourishment of kids. And so unlike the 30s where it was all about farm subsidies, by the, uh, the 30s, by the 40s, it was about farm subsidies and feeding our kids. And I, I think the program passed in a very interesting way as a political compromise between social reformers and Southern Democrats, where basically the Southern Democrats would agree to a school meal program. They wanted farm subsidies, but they did not want the federal government mucking around in their system of education at the state level, which at that time was very, very desegregated and very, very unequal. And the social reformers agreed, who wanted school meal programs, to accept very little federal rules, regulations, and oversight in exchange for getting the program started. Um, and I think that uh, one of, there was an amendment that, um, would prohibit states from discrimination in the delivery of the program, and that failed at that time. So what you actually saw, again, was the beginning of a formal school meal program, but it was actually, at the end of the day, delivered to very few poor children and even fewer African-American children, which then set the stage fast-forwarding to the 60s when America rediscovered poverty and we had Johnson's War on Poverty. 
hunger became a national disgrace. And the shift in the program then, in 1966, was really moving that program away from a kind of voluntary program for states or schools to participate in if they wanted to feed their hungry kids to a program where it was really a poor student's right to have a, a meal during school. And so the program really at this point of time transitioned to one where the federal government defined who was eligible, how the funds can be used. And at that point, a non-discriminatory, this, this reauthorization contained non-discriminatory language. It's important to know, because this really impacted the program moving forward, is that funds could not be used for kitchens or some operational costs. So what schools ended up doing, so they're now required to offer this program, but they didn't quite get enough money. So what schools did was raise the price for meals for paying students so that many of them actually ended up dropping out of the program and not buying lunch, bringing lunch, or going home. And it was really at this time in the late 60s and early 70s that you really saw school meals becoming a program associated with poor students and where you, there was starting to be a stigma for kids who were participating in the program. And that was, a, that was a, a problem that has plagued the program even until today. So let's move into the 70s, and what we saw is not only did ag interests get involved in the school business, but you know, there, the food business was changing a lot, and you were seeing these national food companies, and they wanted to get involved in schools. So this is when you started to see schools and national food business coming together to offer candy, soda, chips, et cetera, in schools. You know, the businesses clearly saw the advantage of having their products in schools, and schools began to see the advantage of selling stuff to kids. And what's interesting is during the 70s, there was a key court case when the USDA, who was clearly established as the reg with the authority to regulate the food served in schools, attempted to regulate food offered outside of the federal meal program, whether that was a la carte items or vendings in sale, and the USDA lost that fight, clearly establishing other people, whether it's the school or the, the food companies, to establish nutritional standards. And the reality is, is there were no standards. I mean, it was very few schools even thought about that question. It also, interestingly enough, had a very big impact on the design of cafeterias because the USDA could regulate what was in the cafeteria but not what's outside the cafeteria. Yes? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear. I'm sorry. When did the USDA pass the, the law of, like, you know, this is how much of vitamin C you're supposed to get? How much, when, so when did, in the first, it was in 1945, but you saw that changing at various times, and the biggest change is coming uh, next year. So that is something, they were given the authority to set that in 1945, and then there were three or four points where that became a big debate, and we'll hit on two of them. Two of the most infamous ones. Actually, the one very, well, in my world, very famous, but <laughs> probably really not. Um, and then the most recent fight, the most recent food fight in Congress. So I will, I will get to that. But that power started early. But the power to regulate food outside that cafeteria was definitely decided that they didn't have in the 70s. And now, actually, in 2010, they went back to Congress and they did get that right, and that will go into effect in two years, or a year and a half from now. So, um, but the um, impact it had on the, my kids went to Evanston Township High School, and the cafeteria there is like this big kind of open room, and you know, kind of right there, the tile would change, and that was the end, official end of the cafeteria. and. On the other side of that wall would be all the vending machines, but it was not the cafeteria. So it, was, it really also ended up impacting even how we designed our cafeterias. So then as we get into the 80s, 
Um, and this is where there was a big national discussion about the nutrition standards. But I think in the 80s, what we saw was a very big decline for all social welfare programs. And the public support for school meal programs also declined. And at that, uh, with, and so the USDA did revisit their nutrition standards. They cut the meal program, and they, and they actually at that point decided that ketchup, or putting ketchup on something constituted a vegetable. Um, and with less money, schools began offering cheaper food. So again, because this program was about increasing the caloric intake, the USDA always had calorie minimums. And so as the budgets declined, schools ended up, in order to meet that calorie requirement, ended up putting more fat into the menu. So it was really during this time that you saw the kinds of foods, you know, really change from more freshly prepared, more uh, fruits and vegetables, and in part because our food system was changing, but in part because they had less money. And remember, from our discussions about the 70s, food manufacturers were now a part of the fabric of school foods, and they were ready and willing to play a major role in introducing cheaper, more processed, less healthy food to our students. So then we get to today, um, and this is actually a, a picture of a, a school here in Chicago. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, Perspectives Charter School, who was one of the first schools to uh, put a whole new meal program in place a number of years ago. So this is not what most of the meals were looking at like as we went into the, the 2000s. But the picture of student health really changed. One of three students were overweight. We all of a sudden woke up and looked at the meal program through a new lens. And what did we find? Highly processed foods that was high in fat and sodium, a lack of infrastructure, poorly trained staff, and a stigma for students who participate. And we, as the public, act shocked. But in reality, it was the logical consequence of every decision that had been made since the 1940s. But before we talk about how, what are the changes that are happening to address this problem? I want to just go to an overview uh, in a minute of the school, an overview of the school food programs today. But does anyone have any questions about the history of the school lunch program? Yes. Um, at my school, I noticed that there, well, nothing is cooked. There is a kitchen, and I'm assuming that that change happened. Uh, at least some things on, on the premises to this throwaway situation where uh, everything's on styrofoam, there is no dishwasher, you know, that whole thing. So all those people were fired, I'm assuming, uh, low-wage workers were fired because of the budget cuts. Well, I think that it happened in a couple of different ways. Actually, it was during that period of the 80s, the 70s and the 80s that you saw it, but you know, I think in your urban communities, there was a kind of a different reality. Um, we in Chicago, I, I don't know the number particularly, but something like 70% of our schools here are more than 80 years old. And in the time that schools were built, it, most of the schools in Chicago, I mean, we just keep using the infrastructure, kids went home. And so in a lot of your urban communities, um, the problem with the school facilities is that they were really never set up with it. But there was a big building boom in schools in the 70s and 80s, and that was the time where you really saw the move towards fast food, convenience food, mass preparation. And that, in a lot of the schools, were actually built um, without you know, full kicking kitchens full cooking kitchens. And in fact, if you followed the news, um, the debate in Chicago about new schools here and whether they should have kitchen continued today and was a major part of the agreement just reached between the Chicago Public School Board and the food server workers, where the food service workers asked for a change in district policy and they did get a commitment um, of 
mo uh, of some number of new schools being built with kitchens. So, you know, that's an infrastructure fight that, you know, hits communities slightly at different points just because of the status of, of their infrastructure. Any other questions about the history? Oh, oh, okay, in the back there. Hi, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on the caloric minimum. Um, what's the amount of calories? Uh, not off the top of my head, but here's what I can tell you. Um, and this leads me into, I took that slide out because I didn't think I'd have enough time, but I could get that information to you. So up until beginning next year, actually, the new rules can't go into effect July 1st. Um, the school meal program requires both a minimum and a maximum. And um, what I can tell you is that for half the age groups, the new maximum calories is less than the old minimum. So, uh, you know, these new rules did two things. First of all, they broke, um, they broke age groups up more. So there were different standards now for more age group before you were K through 8 or 9 through 12, and those were two standards. And obviously, a 5-year-old and a 13-year-old have really different nutrition needs. And secondly, the minimums, I mean, for a whole chunk, they realized we're asking kids to eat, we're giving kids too many calories. But if you see me later, I can um, share the details with you. I just don't remember all those numbers. Anything else before I get into some basic facts? So, you know, it's a big program. I didn't bring the dollar amounts involved, but for breakfast, we're talking about 2 billion meals. And for lunch, we're talking about 5.2 billion meals. Nationally. This is nationally. I, uh, what I can tell you is Chicago Public Schools, out of their district office, served 79 million meals last year. That does not include charters who may have opted for another option. Um, and um, to give you an idea of, of who's eligible, families of four that make 30000 or less are eligible for a free meal. And in Chicago, about 85% of students qualify for a free or reduced meal program. So how much money does a school get, just to give you an idea? The reimbursement rate for this school year was under $3, $2.77, and as you can, per meal. And as you can see, that needs to cover food, labor, and supplies, and milk. And what that really ends up meaning is that most schools have about a dollar to spend on food. That's what the operating assumption is. And clearly, some meals will be 88 cents, and some meals will be $1.20. But most school districts around the country work to get at about a dollar a meal. Um, so on to kind of then what are all the changes that have been happening in the last five to 10 years to really try to transform this program that has been built around uh, giving our kids as many calories for the dollar as we can to one that is going to try to support healthy, balanced eating. So, um, and I'll touch on all of these topics, new nutrition standards, farm to school programs, funding for facilities, wellness policies, increased access, um, food outside the cafeteria, a program called Food Corps and National Leadership. Um, before I go into them in detail, I want to just comment that on a federal level, there are two main pieces of legislation that um, define the school meal program, and one is the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act, um, and, that, and uh, that passed a year ago, December, December of 2010, and I believe was called the Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act, thank you. <laughs> and I have my trusty interns back there helping me when I forget the words. Um, and many of the changes that I'll talk about were part of changes that are ha happened as a result of that uh, act. The other major piece of legislation that defines school food is the Farm Bill. 
Um, and that really focuses more on some of the supply side issues of the meal program in terms of the commodity program, which provides 25% of all of the food that kids eat and um, our various programs around increasing fruit and vegetable consumption. We also, in recent years, have had another piece of national legislation, the stimulus package, um, impact the school meal program. So early, the first stimulus package included $100 million for, school, for kitchen, school kitchen facilities. Really the first influx of uh, money into a school, you know, that schools could use to upgrade their facilities. Needless to say, it nothing resembled the need. Um, so, a little bit then about the new nutritional standards, which were so the U.S. the Congress, um, as part of the CNR reauthorization, uh, mandated that. Um, the uh, Congress that the USDA revised nutritional standards based on an institution, Institute of Medicine report, which had previously come out. And they ended up coming up with a program that had the minimums and maximums, required whole grains, more whole grains. They had not required anyone, but required whole grains, and had required more fruits and vegetables and more variety of fruits and vegetables. Now this, needless to say, was not without its political controversy. And when it looked like the USDA was going to issue regulations that would um, restrict the number of starchy vegetables, particularly potatoes, that kids could have, the uh, senators from Maine and Idaho got very, very involved. Um, and when it looked like the USDA was not going to allow tomato paste um, on pizza to count as a vegetable. So we did move beyond ketchup to tomato paste. So, you know, progress. Um, Schwa the major, um, actually the major frozen pizza companies, which happened to be headquartered in Minnesota, found an advocate in their senators. And the end result was that the USDA was forced to back down and was forced to change its uh, recommendations. Um, so there not only is no restriction on potatoes, there is a requirement that potatoes must be offered at least once a week. Um, and the two tablespoons of tomato paste that is on a slice of pizza does count as a vegetable. We are obviously hoping that schools don't need to follow that. That is the minimum. We are obviously hoping schools don't do that, but it was a very, very uh, heated um, debate. Um, on farm to school, big trends in the last decade. We talked a lot about how the big farmers, agribusiness used the commodity programs, you know, the, the school meal programs for price support. Well, over the last decade, the local, the sustainable ag uh, interest, the local farmers, you know, also wanted to be able to be part of this program. Who does this program benefit if it's going to benefit some farmers? Why was the government only picking one group and not the other group? And therein lies the birth of the farm to school uh, program. And it is a very popular program. It is. Uh, in the f one or two farm bills ago, um, the regulations were changed to allow for local procurement. Even when that happened, we had a big fight with the State Board of Ed here to accept that regulation. Um, there was, um, in the, the, they created a farm to school grant program and then didn't fund it, but that got funded in the last um, reauthorization. Um, and there's a lot of activity happening at state levels to figure out how to use the school meal program to support local agriculture. So in terms of some of these other issues, um, the last reauth of the 2004 uh, Child Nutrition Act required school districts to set up wellness teams, understanding that you can't just bring healthy food into the cafeteria without preparing the kids. And so this provision was designed to force school districts to think about how they were doing nutrition education and physical activity. 
There were efforts to increase access by making it easier for school districts who have huge numbers of free and reduced kids to have eligibility, and there was um, an expansion of breakfast programs and grants for school districts to put breakfast in the programs in schools. Um, there was an attempt to look at food outside the cafeteria and give the USDA authority to regulate all, all the food sold in school, and those regulations are being developed right now. Um, funding for facilities, which I already mentioned. And then um, the Congress created a program called FUCOR, which is like AmeriCorps, which brings young people into communities to help support local food systems. And a lot of them, I think almost half of them, work with schools. And they're helping garden, they're helping do nutrition ed, and in some communities they're even helping on the procurement side. So the last part of this effort to um, change uh, the whole meal program to one that's supporting health is national leadership from the First Lady. And this picture um, is from a year ago, um, and the young man is uh, Alex from um, Walsh Elementary School, who had the honor and privilege of introducing the First Lady at this event where she recognized 1,200 schools who met the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, which is a recognition program that we're work working closely with the Chicago Public Schools to promote, which is helping schools figure out ways to support nutrition education and physical activity. The First Lady also has a Chef's Move to School program. It has Salad Bar Move to School, and obviously the White House Garden has become a national symbol for bringing gardening back to our homes, our communities, and to our schools. So we're seeing a lot of leadership coming from the White House. So while this debate is happening at the national level, this debate is well and live in communities across the country, including here in Chicago. And I think the five things that are most most part of this national debate or this local debate is discussing what kids should eat. There is a debate about whether or not you should make kids food, whatever that is, healthy, or if you need to introduce kids to healthier, to adult food. It also is a question about how school districts should be addressing the ethnic um, and cultural preferences of its students. There's a big debate about when should students eat. Many schools do not offer lunch at lunchtime. They're offering it at 9.30 in the morning or 2.30 in the afternoon. And so it's really trying to force schools to relook at where uh, the length of time um, and when it is. Um, where should food be cooked? Um, there clearly is a move to cooking in the, ca in the school, but there, what other models of uh, food production and distribution are appropriate? And whether or not, I mean, Revolution Foods, which is one of these new companies that emerged, does commissary cooking. There are some of your old standard um, companies that um, I like to always say it's like airplane food, but we don't have food on airplanes anymore, so younger people don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it comes in the little plastic containers and gets heated up. So what's the most appropriate way to, to, create, to, to make and deliver food is a big part of this discussion. And then what about the workers? Where, how are we paying them? What, what, um, how are we training them? What role are they having in uh, this whole discussion? And finally, what about other food in the school or the classroom? It's really hard for a cafeteria to offer healthy food and have chocolate being sold by the soccer team as you walk outside the cafeteria. And this debate is alive and well here in Chicago. So this diagram here actually represents all of the things that Healthy Schools Campaign is working on with the Chicago Public Schools to change the school food and fitness environment. So you see at the top nutritional standards. Two years ago, CPS adopted new nutrition standards that went into effect that actually mirror the standards that are now going to be required. So the district has to make very few changes um, in their meal program. Um, we also have a farm to school program here. CPS has a Either, either the largest or the second largest farm to school program. I keep fighting with the people in Baltimore on this point. 
Um, but they actually put together a local uh, flash frozen program that's become a model for school districts around the country and actually opened up farm to school programs to other school districts in the Midwest where the produce is flash frozen within 48 hours of being uh, picked and then delivered. We also, Chicago Public Schools uh, is the first school district to make a major purchase of antibiotic free chicken. They have a partnership now with Miller's Farm. If you shop at Whole Foods, same company. Um, and that also led to bringing back the cooking of chicken in cafeterias. Now, it's not every school. It's about 66% of the schools are part of that program because CPS have different providers that are in a different, uh, are at different places in their march to improving food. Um, so we, CPS also has been a leader in uh, nutritional uh, standards for breakfast cereal and in fact got the Kellogg company to change their business model and bring Kashi into the school market. Again, that is something that's available to all school districts around the country. Um, so we also have a lot of other things going on with school gardenings, healthy classrooms, uh, role models, and a lot of other programs that are here uh, in Chicago. So that gives me a couple of minutes to just talk to you about the role of teachers. Um, and teachers can play very, very critical roles. It's very difficult for a school district to offer totally new food in the cafeteria and expect the kids to accept it. In fact, when CPS did bring in those new nutritional standards, participation rate dropped, particularly in high schools, but also at the grammar school levels. It's bounced back a little bit, but not completely. So that's why we're working with the district to, on a go for the gold initiative to help schools become recognized by the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. And we have about 100 schools that have either been recognized or have, are on their, have submitted the application. And of all those schools, there's only one high school that has uh, participated in the program. Um, but teachers can play a very, very critical role in terms of incorporating curriculum into the classroom around food. And clearly all of you are here, so this must be on your mind and hopefully in your plans to bring back to the classroom. But we have somewhere here um, on a table someplace or being handed out, I'm not sure. Um, it'll be outside, um, a couple of resources um, for you to help do that. One is from Illinois Net, which is the Illinois Nutrition Education and Training Program. Just a sample of the resources they have on their website. This is for 9 to 12 grades, math and science curriculum. And then a, a, a very good curriculum from John Hopkins on how to teach about food systems. Um, but beyond the, what you teach, it's what you do that will really matter. Um, how you manage your classrooms, how you're using food as a reward, what you do about birthday celebrations, all send very, very important messages to the students about the importance of, of uh, healthy eating. And your behavior in the classroom, how you are a role model is critically important. Whether or not you are um, sitting at your desk with a can of soda or a bag of chips or all the different ways that what you do influences what the students might think about what is appropriate way to be healthy. And finally, um, we, there are many teachers across the district and across the country that have become major change agents for working with their schools to make all sorts of changes. Um, and here in Chicago, again, it's mostly around the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. Um, and we have some materials out on the table if you might be interested in getting involved. So any questions? They have a grant. Um, it's due June 30th. And do you have any idea about what type of budget setup they want? I mean, there are a lot of grants out there for schools. About teach for Classroom, the one that you just mentioned about. The Fit to Learn program or? I mean, we offer a professional development program for teachers that's free, but it's K through, tw uh, K through five. 
maybe I don't I don't know what particular grant program you're referring to. I mean, there are a number of different ones. Is this something coming out of the district office? Oh, the John Hopkins? You know what, I'm sorry, I don't know anything. I don't know. I don't have that information. I'm sorry I misunderstood. CPS's environmental <laughs> department kind of folded up, you know. Um, we, were, we were part of composting and some other things. Do you have any idea um, when they are going to fill that position? I, I got an email last night saying it's been filled. Um, and I have the contact information. I'm not remembering the person's name. Meredith sticks in my mind, but um, I think just this week. Hi, thank you very much for that um, discussion. I actually have a question about uh, school gardens. And I know there's a lot of them popping up around the city, a lot of teachers getting involved in them. And I also know that the food grown in those are not able to be served. Can you comment on that? Yeah, um, you know, Denver's figured out how to do it. And if they can figure it out, we can figure it out here. Uh, CPS has lots of lawyers and legal, and right now, um, it's sitting there for their review. Um, but um, there has been a group of people that have been working hard um, to create some guidance that would meet both CPS's legal department and the Chicago Department of Public Health. And they've come up with something and, you know, we're waiting to get it through legal. So hopefully soon. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Well, the, your own, so CPS, uh, you may not know, has a health officer now, Dr. Stephanie White. That's a new position that they created um, oh, about February. A year ago, they created the position of health and uh, manager of health and wellness promotion. A woman named Annie Lyonberger is the director of that. Um, she now has, they now have decided to hire someone full time to work on bringing back recess. And my understanding is there will be a position for encouraging physical education. Annie, and, and then there's some grant funded positions, but Annie Lyonberger is the person that is uh, heading up that. And if you, you give me her card, your card, or I can give you her email um, if you want to be in touch with her. Hi. Thank you again. I'm not sure how this is going to go for you specifically, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Uh, fine, we deal with the kids in the building, then they go home. Uh, I grew up with a mother that fixed square meal dinners every night for her eight kids. Uh, most of our students, uh, a lot of our students do not have that. How do we deal with that problem? Yeah, I mean, and I think we really like came front and center with that problem with our high school culinary competition where we worked with your culinary program to give kids nutrition education and have them compete to make a healthy school meal, many of which are now part of the regular rotation. And when we interviewed them about why they, whether they took any of these lessons home and they said no, many because they didn't have basic cookware. So for a small group of kids, we got TFAIL to donate cookware so they all get cookware. But um, I think there are a lot of efforts going on in the city. I, I don't think it can be just the schools. Um, the mayor clearly is committed to bringing grocery stores uh, and making into communities that don't have them. The Department of Public Health has a number of programs. But we have seen um, schools, mostly at the grammar school level, where um, we, have, we have worked with a lot of parents across the city who are working with their schools, but who are also making sure that there are programs for bringing it home. I think parent programs that connect parents around this in high school are very few and far between. I'm not familiar with any effective, uh, any really effective models at the high school level. It's just the parent-school connection is much harder. Um, but we do know that um, a number of, of your grammar school principals are doing excellent jobs of sending messages home and engaging parents around healthy eating. But again, I think it has to be a partnership with everyone in the community. We're talking to a number of the hospitals about getting more involved. Um, 
And, you know, so there's not going to be one solution, but it absolutely is a problem. Um, I have a question, but also to piggyback on that, a great organization that helps with sort of that dinner aspect and after you get home is Common Threads. I don't know yeah. if anybody is familiar with that. Um, it's in several neighborhoods in the city, and it's just a fantastic uh, cooking teaching organization for, for young people. Um, and it's completely free, and there's a garden and all that stuff. Um, but I do have a question for you from the, the political angle. Um, the Let's Move campaign has come under so much fire from the political right um, as sort of this like socialist <laughs> endeavor to take over our country. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, if you've met similar resistance in your campaign and, and what that looks like, and do you think that those challenges have really made an impact on your policy making? And I guess how do we surmount those? Well, I mean, I, I, you know. So, you know, I've kind of been at this for a long time, almost 10 years, and I got to tell you, it does ha help to have a champion in the White House on your particular topic. Um, and in spite of the political opposition that it might bring, it has done so much more good. I, I think in terms of where the resistance is, you know, I have never met a teacher, a principal, or a school administrator that did not understand that student health was important. But they did not, they do not have the knowledge or skills to transfer what they know to be important to their classrooms and schools. And if you look at the professional develop, the pre-service and professional development programs for teachers and for principals, it's not surprising that that's the situation. There are only five states in the country that actually have any uh, pre-service requirements for um, any, anything related to health. And more than half of the states in this country require no ongoing professional development on anything related to health, and we used a pretty broad definition. But even if the teachers and principals were able to transform what, transfer what they know to be true to their classroom and schools, right now the metrics and accountability systems that are are at play in our country don't really support that integration. So I think for us, we have really started to focus on really looking at education policy and both in terms of professional pre-service and professional development and looking at the metrics and accountability structures that schools have. In Chicago, at the top of your school progress report is a little thing that says, a uh, healthier school, yes or no. And um, I mean, I think integrating that into, into the accountability structures that we are asking you to meet is what will change it. So it's just without providing people with the knowledge and skills or without creating the, um, you know, the accountability structures that work, it's just always gonna be an up uphill battle. 